The title of my message is Awaken the Free, and uh, I thought we could start up but with a, just a little bit of humor, if that's all right, ladies. It's a privilege to serve you with God's Word for just a moment, and, uh, and it's been a treat being a part of this moment in time for our church. I thought Tess said it so well. There is significance to firsts, and, uh, and so I'm excited about this. Listen to this. God and Adam were talking through the Garden of Eden, discussing various things. At one point, Adam says, wow, God, you surely made Eve awfully beautiful. Every lady said... Amen. Just amazingly beautiful, spoke the Lord. Yes, my son, that is so that you would love her very deeply. And after a brief moment, Adam hesitantly commented, but Lord, you made Eve uh, not all that smart. And God said, yes, uh, that's because she would love you very deeply. Every part of me knows this is helping my marriage right now. And so... Awaken the free. I believe God wants to put freedom in this place today. Nanda, you're awesome. You're a blessing. We love you. And, uh, and we're grateful that you said yes to the invitation. We're better for it. I know your family's with you, and uh, we're just so excited to have you all with us. And this probably won't be the last time we do something together. And so you're a breath of fresh air. I thought between last night, Tess kind of speaking into awakening desire, and this morning, Nanda kind of leading us into what it means to journey with God, being awakened to who He is. Uh, that there really is a sense of a freedom coming upon us. Like there's something about those moments when you realize, man, I'm not such a big deal when it comes to the issues I have, the things that hold me back. Like they're, they're actually in the way of a far greater thing, which is to know Him and to pursue His purpose on my life. And so awakening desire to Him is powerful. I love how Tess spoke about beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And, and truth be told, I'm not a feet guy either. And I was praising Jesus for some new beautiful feet right there. Amen. I want to be. I want to be. Um, I want to be pretty open, and honest with you, ladies, today, if that's okay. Um, and then I thought, just the whole idea of the good shepherd, uh, that word agape love. That was such a beautiful picture of how you brought that to us, and, and that he brings us rest in that space. And so I want to speak a little bit about freedom. And I was thinking about awaken, and obviously it's been said already. It's to wake from sleep, or to become aware of something that already is. Uh, that kind of that kind of speaks to me. An awakening is, yeah, literally to wake up from sleep, but it's also to be awakened to the thing that was already there. In other words, it's kind of like God is already doing something. Uh, God already put beauty inside you, gold inside you. Part of the privilege of parenting young girls is to keep reminding them what's already there. You know, they're growing into what is already there. That's why Jesus said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Like, he sees with the end in mind, right? Right? We're figuring it out. We're on a journey toward awakening to the thing that was always there. I love that about us because sometimes we're just not aware of the thing God's put inside of us. It's not that it's not there. It's not that we aren't beautiful. It's not that we don't have the potential to shape culture and change nations. It's not that we don't carry the presence of light in our hearts. It's not that we can't parent children to change the world. Amen, every mom. It's that we're not aware it's, it's there. And so I want to speak into God awakening in us the thing that's already there. And I was thinking about Genesis. You know, the story says that God formed everything and was beautiful. And every day he said it was good. And then he forms man. And he says it's good. Amen. Amen. And then he he said, but it's not good, first time, for man to be alone. First time we hear something's out. And so he makes woman. And we all know the story, Adam awakens to Eve, and we believe in those days they would have been naked and unashamed. Praise Jesus. And and, and he awakens to this moment, and he says, woman, this is now bone of bones and flesh of my flesh. Uh, The Bible language for that moment in time is, Adam says, she's it. So in other words, he's, he's toured the world. He's named the animals. He's checked them out, giraffes, like he's got the whole deal going on. No help suitable for Eve, for Adam. He sees Eve, or well, he hasn't called her that yet, but he sees the woman, she's it. Like whatever was missing, it's here now, all right? And, and I, I want to just kind of speak a bit of that into you. You see, I'm a dad of girls, and I believe that women have something beautiful in their hearts that is different to a man. And, um, you know, the, the, the name man in the Hebrew is the, is the name Ish, all right? Not that that matters much to you, hey, but, but if, the, if I told you the next part, the name woman is Isha. All right, now in the Hebrew language, the only difference between the spelling of man and woman is one little letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it's the letter He, which is the fifth letter, it's the letter of grace. 
The only difference between the naming of man and the naming of woman in the creation of the world is grace. In other words, there is a unique grace God gives to woman that isn't on us as men. There is something beautiful about the early name woman that speaks to what you carry that we're still becoming aware of, by the way. Part of the challenge for men is not to find beauty, that's obvious, is to see the grace, the thread that runs below everything that's obvious in the woman in our world today. And I think the church is seeing it. And so you have this woman, and I was thinking, well, she, she was born, Adam was sleeping, like, like, it wasn't my master plan to find Tess. That was God's, right? I was fast asleep. I don't know what I was up to back then. And she came past us. I was like, hmm, you know? But Adam was sleeping. But listen to this. Eve was born into an awakened world. She wasn't sleeping. Eve, Eve arrived on the scene, and it was awake. It was, there was life happening. Listen, girls, you were born and created into not a world that needs to be awakened, and a world that was already awakened. And perhaps what's been lost is the sense, what was always there. You were born into an awakened world. And so there's this beautiful name, woman, Esha, graced one, that was born into an awakened world. And it's pretty and it's beautiful. And then we know the story. Adam and Eve chose to kind of go after their own desires. They were deceived by the devil. And, and they went down the road. And suddenly what happened was they started to see their nakedness. This is the story of what we call the fall of man. Everything God created was good, and then there was this moment where they see their nakedness. You see, up until this point, nakedness was great. It was a blessing. It was beautiful. In fact, I often say nakedness was normal. To say it in another way, who they were was good enough. And then the fall takes place, and who they are is no longer enough. The Bible says, so they start to cover themselves up, and they add layers. And we all know what layers can look like. Girls know about layers. Amen. Guy got two items, girl got 300, needs four coat hangers for each one just to be at, you know. Like you should see back there, like the ladies change their jacket and there's like three wardrobes just to choose. And I'm just thinking like layers, you know. Layers. And uh, we layer our Instagram accounts. And we layer our, um, you know, our, our, our financial worlds. We make it look like it's awesome, but we're dying and... You know, we, we, we lay our relationships, and that the truth? I mean, who you are in the, in the mess of a marriage is actually okay. Why do you layer it? Why do you try and make it look like something it isn't? I loved your honesty. I loved the, just the beauty and the honesty of your story, and, and, and I like that because it's, it's, a, it's a real raw, it's like nakedness is normal. Who you are is enough. We, we don't need layers. We don't need a man on our shoulder to prove that we are worth it. we got God who's already said that. We don't, we don't need layers. We don't, we don't need beauty therapists, although, like Tess said, they're going to continue to exist because they're awesome and they get me brownie points. It's not about her. It's about every time she goes, I win. <laughs> Selfish like that. But we have layers because we don't think that who we are is good enough. And uh, let me tell you that there may be men out there who want you to be laid up. They expect something of you that's more than who you are. They maybe as a dad have even spoken layers of your life because they're expecting you to be or expected you as his girl to be something more than what you actually just were. There may be men out there who, who, who expect the layers, who want the layers, who desire the layers, but there's one man I know that wasn't into layers, and you see, Adam was a picture of Jesus going to sleep so that the church could be birthed. That's what's going on in the story. It's never about Adam and Eve or you and I. It's all about Jesus and his beautiful bride, friends. And so Jesus goes to sleep and wakes up to a beautiful church. He says, she's it. This group of women sitting in the auditorium in Salt Rock, was the whole reason Jesus died on the cross. I know there's many in this guild conferences. I'm told there's another three happening in Durban as I speak. But I want to tell you, friends, that when Jesus woke from the sleep, which was the cross of Calvary, and he came to life again because the story always ends with him winning, amen, he woke up and he saw the bride, which is you and I, mixed up and unsure and confused, and he said, this is it. I want these people as they are. And so while there was a man, or maybe there, were, there are men in your life who, who want something out of you, there's a man who gave a piece of himself for you, and he's madly in love with you. 
And so if you're going to take a hashtag down today, it simply goes like this. Hashtag, it's nice to be naked. Why don't you tap your girlfriend next to you, let her know, it's nice to be naked. What I'm going to do is just build some marriages while I'm at it. And uh, <laughs> You should have known, girl, that when you gave me the microphone, it's nice to be naked. Tap your second choice on the other side and do it again. This is nice to be naked. It's nice to be naked. Anyway, Mark chapter 5. Let's talk about this for just a moment. Mark chapter 5. Uh, verse 25, it's a story of a bleeding woman, and I want to speak into uh, how your rawness is what he really wants to work with. Uh, your honest heart is what he wants to work with. Uh, he's not wanting to work with the three layers and the five words that you strung out to make everyone think that you were godly this morning. He wants to work out with the thought you had when you went to bed last night, when your man rolled over in the opposite direction and you wondered, am I enough? He wants to work with what you think is not good enough. Mark chapter 5, I speak honest to you there. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. There are always crowds around Jesus. It's no mistake, the conference is full. We got all excited. We said, the conference is full. I'm like, us, oh, Jesus at the center. What do you think? People are going to wait? People want him. He's that good. Best thing that ever happened to me, praise Jesus. And a woman was there, had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. It's a long time. Some of us have had a hard week, 12 years. And she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, all she had. Anyone given it a go? Anyone kind of worked the system? You done, you done Myers, Briggs, Enneagram, you done Strengths Finder Analysis 3.410. I mean, you, you honestly, there is not another thing you can invest in to find out who you are. Everything. And yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. My voice is going, praise Jesus, it's a women's conference. Maybe God's trying to let me know something. <laughs> and when she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, not when, not when, um, not when somebody handed you five tips to success, not when someone told you you're beautiful. They're just affirming something that's already there, by the way. That's, that's not new news. That shouldn't be new news to you. You are beautiful. You're loved. You're chosen. You're graced. You are girl, and you're awesome. But when she saw Jesus, yes, come on. He's putting money in the bank right there as well. When she saw Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak. I want to say, ladies, there's a difference between the crowd and the cry. There's always a crowd, but she had a cry. I've noticed God loves to work with the cry of humanity. Can I say it like this? He always hears the cry of the oppressed. You know, that one of the reasons God moved on the nation of Israel is because he said, I've seen their affliction. I've heard their cry, and I've come down to meet with them, and I will lead them to a spacious place, a land flowing with milk and honey. Let me tell you, ladies, you got, if you've got a cry in your heart today, God's got some healing for you. If you've got a cry in your heart today, I saw last night as Tess closed a message, I saw as you stand, stood in response, I saw tears across this place. That's a cry. It's beautiful, and it's good for God. You see, a crowd means nothing to Jesus. A cry of our hearts is what he's looking for. And she touched his cloak because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. The word there is, I'll be made whole. It's a word, sozo. I'll talk about it just now. And immediately her bleeding stopped. Immediately her bleeding stopped. Amazing how we, we try everything but the one thing. Like we give everything a shot. But honestly, if you would just reach out to Jesus with an honest cry from your heart, I believe your bleeding is going to stop. And she felt that her body had been freed from her suffering. Isn't that a beautiful thought? At once Jesus realized that power had gone from him and he turned around to the crowd and he asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people are crowding against you. The disciples answered. And yet how can you ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. You see, he wants to, he wants to find your eyes. He wants to see you. You see, you're in a crowd today and there'll be moments in worship and there's gonna be this little moment where no one knows it's happening but you're crying out to God. You're asking him to meet you in your time of need and he's heard your cry and he's already released his power because he never holds back power from the cry of our hearts, right? But I wanna tell you, he's not done at that moment. He's looking around. He felt someone in the room of 500 ladies or 400 or 300,000, I don't know how many in here, but he's felt somebody in the room lent a bit further. Somebody's heart just went a bit further. Somebody isn't just here. Somebody's here to do business with him. 
And he's looking for your eyes because when you, when you speak into eyes, you speak into the soul. It's, he wants to find your eyes. And then the woman, knowing what had happened, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, the whole truth. <laughs> God, I'm battling with this one thing. Reminds me of the story of the woman at the well. Jesus, I'm not married. No, you're right when you say you're not married. You've actually been through five husbands, and the one you're with is currently not your husband. You say a very true thing, and she's like, wow. She goes running back to the village after a little bit of an interchange with Jesus, runs back to the village and says, I found a man, listen, who knows everything about me. She was running from it, meets Jesus, goes back and says, he knows everything, and he's good with it, guys. And uh, I think God wants to hear your hearts, ladies. I know you protect it and you layer it because you don't think it's worth it to us as men, but we don't matter. Only one man does. He says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I've got two big ideas from this story that I want to leave with you, things that are just burning on my heart for the ladies, not just of this house, but for this nation. And the first is, as I am, as I am. She, she leans in in this crowd-like moment, as she is. Listen, it would have been, it would have been so counterculture, so, so un, uh, what's the word? Like just so not good, not cool, so not, not celebrated for her as a woman battling with bleeding. Like, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty graphic scenario. It's, 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 it's kind of like, as I say it to a group of ladies, it's, it's as far as it can go to be embarrassed. And yet she leans in, in this state. It's been 12 years. She's not having a, a brief moment of healing. There's been nothing. It's got worse, the Bible says. And so at her worst, she leans in with a cry, as she is, as my marriage is, as my inner world is, as my mom spirit is. I mean, I know you're dropping off the kids and you, you're doing what you can and you're high-fiving them and you're praying for them, but as you are, tired. You don't think you got it. You're not sure your kids are ever going to return home and say, this is the best thing that ever happened to me, so, you know, landing up in your home. As you are, lean in, as I am. You see, it's amazing. That word, um, bleeding, is a reference to Isaiah 64.6. Isaiah 64.6 says it like this. All of us have become like one who's unclean, and all of our righteous acts, listen, are like filthy rags. That, those words, filthy rags, is it translated, literally translated, and I, I'm not being graphic to be cool or anything in this room. I'm just, I want you to get this. The word filthy rags is translated soiled clothing. It's the same language that we get from a bleeding woman. And what, what, what Isaiah is saying far ahead of time is our efforts to make ourselves right with God are like soiled, are like bleeding, are like broken clothing. That's, that's how far our efforts take us and she comes at the end of her efforts to receive what has always been on offer in grace and she receives it listen there's no there's no like hey God I was thinking about how I've been struggling with she just leans out and he just discharges that's what takes place you know when I come to church honestly I'm not looking for somebody to say hey Dill you're a great pastor I'm coming here because Jesus loves his bride and when Jesus is with his bride there's a power that is transferred into us and so when I'm in the moment, when I'm in worship, when I'm receiving a word, whether it's from, you know, Monday or my wife or it's, I don't care, I'm here to touch Jesus because he never holds back power. And our righteous acts, our efforts, ladies, your attempts, can I, can I challenge some of you today? You, you've, you've been doing church for a long time, but, but it's like you're still just in the crowd. Let this conference weekend, let it be a defining moment where you lean, you weave, you move through the crowd. There's people around. They've got some ideas about you. Maybe they even like you. But you're kind of going beyond them. You're going, girl, I like you, and I'm with you, and I'm your friend, and we're going to be good. But I'm actually here for Jesus. And for the rest of my life, he's going to come first before your opinion, before where you want me to be on Friday night, before you want me to do with my money. I'm after Jesus. And when you go after Jesus with that spirit, power always leaves him. You know, um, Paul said, I believe it's Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto my salvation. That word salvation is a word soterio. 
a Greek word. So to any Greeks in the house tonight, other than, where's my friend Leanne Paterimos? Am I saying it right? Soterio. She basically said, absolutely not, but don't worry, keep, keep preaching, Pastor. Soterio is, is all. It is, a, it is a word that describes everything. So I'm not ashamed of the, of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, which is what we preach here at Link Church that make us have beautiful feet. For it is the power of God unto our soterio, unto our total healing. Soterio is where we get the word sozo from, all right? Sozo is what she said would take place if she touched Jesus. So when Jesus is preached in his fullness, not as a nice to have, not as a place to be on a weekend, not as like you need to be a Christian if you want to make it to heaven. Honestly, that stuff's secondary. I dealt with it a long time ago. When Jesus is preached in his fullness as the good shepherd, right, that leads me to green pastures for his name's sake, when that is preached, there is a sozo that takes place if you would receive it. That is your total healing. As I am. She touched his garments. I'm told that priests in those days would have tassels, we, we're told, that they would fall from their garments and, and there would be a blue tassel. Blue was a picture of heaven and the finished work of Christ in people's lives. And, and it would have been the first thing she would have had access to. And so the first thing she touches is the thing that represents the final payment for everything she had lacked maybe in her life. The forgiveness of Christ. She, touched, she leans in. Friends, listen, we're not leaning into Jesus to maybe fix us. We're leaning into a Jesus that has already fixed it. He's already paid. He's already won. He's already, there is, a, there is a journey toward the awakening that was always in us that God now wants to bring us toward again. And she touches his garments and she receives her healing and there's a finished work and it says everything about, she's made whole and he says, go in peace. I wonder if there's anxiety in the church because we're, we're, we're kind of taking it on our terms. God, I'll take you at that line, but over here I'm not keen to hang on. You see, when it says she touched his garment, the word is actually she latched on. She latched on. God, I'm here, but I don't want everyone to know that I'm going through some stuff, so I'm just going to, don't worry about it. Honestly, they don't matter as much as you think they do. Just lean in, grab his garment, latch on, don't let go. It's going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. My, my daughter, Mackenzie, you may know the story. She came into our room one day. She's like, Mom, Dad. Mom, dad, like early, like 5.30 early, all right? Like, this better be good, girl. And so she's like, dad, mom, you've got to understand. I've just, I've just realized something. She was watching TV. We could hear her in the background. We weren't sure what it was. And she's like, I've just realized something. We're like, what is it? What have you seen? What have you realized? She said, I'm watching Narnia. And we're like, that's awesome. Hundredth time, like literally hundredth time. And she says, I'm watching Narnia. I'm like, what's, the, what's awesome? She says, Aslan is Jesus. Ha, <laughs> ha. And Tess and I look at each other, and we're like, like, forget about sleep. Let's throw a praise party, because she's just seen the most precious thing she'll ever see in her life. And some of us have watched the movie so many times. We've, we've watched the movie. We've heard the songs. We've seen the scenes. We've, we've watched it in others. But we need revelation for ourselves that Jesus literally does have a finished work that comes from his life. That if I would lean in and touch it and receive it and take it, I would be made whole. Tap your neighbor and say, it's nice to be naked. <laughs> Ain't that the truth, girl? Hey, Tess. It's nice to be naked. <laughs> what was that song? Sozo, all I am, listen to this, for all you are. Uh, not just a part of me for a part of you. Not just... I bought a ticket so that I could be part of the sisterhood brand. All I am for all you are. I just watched the movie, Dad, for the hundredth time, but I just saw what I missed the whole time. Jesus, he's the king in the movie. And they're safe with him. And there's a rest that is produced when they discover Aslan's heart. 
And I believe, ladies, God wants to show you himself in this moment. There are crowds all around Jesus. Think about this. If there's crowds around him, it's hard to see him. And it almost requires that we, we weave through the noise to see him. The noise of busy schedules. The noise of people's expectations. Come on, ladies. The noise of perhaps words that have been spoken over my life. You know, you spoke about anointing. Anointing is such a powerful thing because it happens from the head down. There's a reason for it. It takes place from the top down. That's why the Bible says, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. Don't get mixed up in what people are kind of going on about. Be transformed, what does it say? By the renewing of your mind, head down. You've got to get this into your spirit. It's got to come from the head down. You've got to receive it in this moment. It's being preached through the airwaves, but you've got to receive it. I've got to renew my mind to think Jesus is a available to me and who I am is enough all I am for all he is say amen if you believe it in this place you see Jesus is whatever we need him to be for whatever we're in need of that's why to the blind he was sought Hmm. to the thirsty he was life-giving water to the hungry he was bread To the weak, he was strength. To the anxious, he was peace. To the lonely, he was a friend. To the wanderer, he was purpose. But it ain't coming your way unless you put down this layer thing that you got going on, girl. Maybe I'll close. Um, There's a story, I think it's in Matthew 14. Maybe we have a scripture. Did I give you that scripture? I can't remember. But... um, Jesus has just fed thousands of people, like he's feeding you ladies now. You know, one of the things I love about Jesus is he doesn't ask anything from us. He just gives. In fact, he's more pleasured by us taking what he offers than by us offering what, he th- what we think he needs. It's almost disrespectful to God to think that we can add to the excess that's already there. It's a pleasure to Him. It's respect. It's honor. It's worship to Him when we go, God, actually, there's so much excess up there. You mind if I grab some for my lack down here? And when we receive what heaven offers, when we take what Jesus gives, when we hold on to the tassel, when we receive, as I am for all you are, it's like He smiles and goes, now you're getting it. This is why I came. Bible says not to be served, but to serve. So God is wanting to serve ladies, serve ladies, serve you with a word in season, serve you with peace for your heart, serve you with courage for the call that's on your life. He wants to serve you. I know you came here for him, but honestly, he came here for you. You know, Mary and Martha, we love the story. Jesus in the house, Mary and Martha, Mary's sitting, Martha's serving, running around, dishes, I do the dishes in my house, just to say. I cook, clean, make the bed, do the dishes. And Martha's serving. Mary's sitting. And Jesus says, Martha, 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 why are you concerned for so many things? What Mary has been after is the one thing that matters. And, you know, we preach that message. We say, listen, God doesn't want you to be serving. God wants you to be sitting. That's not true. It's not that he doesn't want you to be serving. He's that he doesn't want the serving to produce, weight, anxiety. The issue was never that Martha was doing many things. is that she was concerned for many things. Come on. We need rest. And you have a moment in time now for 48 hours, 24, 48. I don't care. Give it a week if you want. To rest and to receive. The beautiful thing about the Mary Martha story is it's kind of like Jesus was saying, listen, if you, if you just sit and receive, you go back and do the same many things, this time without concern. <laughs> it's not that what you were doing was wrong, it, that was producing in you anxiety. That's not the will of God. So Jesus is um, he's feeding thousands like he's feeding the ladies today. And... Um, he finished feeding them and he sends them across the lake. He says, I'll come meet you the other side. And as they're paddling across the lake, they come into a pretty vicious storm. And the Bible says that the waves are lapping up against the boats and they're getting a bit kind of stressed out. I don't know if you've ever felt like waves lap up against life. You know, they lap up against your boat. And it's kind of like you just, you just come out of a miracle moment in the one sense, something's happening. And now you're in 
in the middle of the ocean and the waves are lapping and it's like, what happened? Like, which one of y'all kicked me, you know? And, uh, and, and Jesus is now standing. It's a movie scene. I think three people in the room caught it, but that's cool. I'll just commit rush hour, I believe it was. Anyone watch Russia? Tap your nose. Which one of y'all kicked me? Because it doesn't always, you don't always know where it comes from. Anyway, and so, so they're, on the, they're on the thing. This could go pear-shaped if I don't wrap it up quickly. And they're on the, they're on the, they're on the lake. And Jesus, listen, I was in mine Arbol, which is where they believed to have fed the thousands. And Arbol overlooks the Sea of Galilee. And so he is within our sights of what's going on with his people. Listen, he's always within our sights of what's going on with his people. He's not, he's not confused by your situation. He's not unaware of your situation. His eyes are on you, girl. And he sees what's going on with his people from a distance. The world is... And uh, he takes a walk down and he says, he comes walking along the water. Listen, Jesus always walks on the very thing that you're worried about. Waves are lapping. <laughs> Jesus come walking on the waves. You know, God, I'm not sure where this leaves me in this nation. Is it even safe for me to raise my daughters in this nation? Jesus come walking on the water. God, I'm not sure that I'm going to make it through this season. I'm not sure, God, that I'm ever going to have a place to play in society. Jesus comes walking on the water, it says, it says in the story, he comes to them on the fourth watch of the night. Now, if you go and look at the timeline of an evening, the fourth watch is the final watch. You can Google it, Sister Google, right? You can Google it, and the final watch is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. That's when Jesus arrives. 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning is what is the darkest time of the night. I don't know if it feels like sometimes it gets darker and darker. But he comes walking toward them at the darkest time of the night on the very thing that they're most afraid of. Maybe he's doing that for you right now. And there's this whole thing, and Peter walks on water, and, you know, Jesus gets in the boats, and the storms calm down. But I wanted to ask you a question as I close with you today. What comes after the dark? Dawn always dawn always dawn and it's almost like Jesus gets in the story Matthew 14 and he sends them off but he wants to show life is going to present things to them but he will always show up sometimes when it feels darkest but it's just before the dawn it's just before the dawn it's not the first watch when the light starts to dim it's not the second when it's getting a bit worse it's not the third when you're kind of waking up to a screaming kid it's the fourth watch when you've got nothing left it's so dark you can't see and here he comes walking why because the darkest time is just before the dawn and he's always in those moments and I believe that there's a new day God is speaking over his girls in this nation there's a new day he's speaking over children in your home, girls in your home. Oh man, ladies, if you think you're leaving this conference strong, wait until the next generation comes through Awakening Conference 2035 because they're going to be dominating. <laughs> Stand with me, I want to tell you a little story. We were in, um, we were in Mauritius just a few years ago and uh, myself and my brother-in-law uh, decided to try out sailing as you do, right? And uh, so anyway, we, we went and got ourselves a little Hobie cat that looked like it could take us to the moon. And, um, and, and we climbed on this Hobie cat and there was a bit of a kind of protected bay where we started out. And, uh, and it was nice and it was calm and it was just a gentle breeze and we just floated ourselves across the bay. And uh, we're getting agitated though. It was kind of boring. Life is kind of boring. Isn't that what happens? Like you, you kind of play it safe and then you go, no, I want to live for something bigger. And then you try the something bigger. And then what happened is we kind of started to push the boundaries. We find ourselves not in the bay anymore. Now we're in the open sea and the wind's vicious out there. So we just dropped the sails. It's like, whoa, everyone just, <laughs> just calm down. It's just him and I on a Hobie cat. Never sailed in our lives before. And uh, we looked at each other and now the boat's kind of tipping like this. We're not going anywhere, but it's kind of violent. I feel like that sometimes. It's like, I'm not going anywhere, but it just feels unraveling. I'm, my life doesn't seem to be growing. It just, it's just overwhelming. And we had this moment in time where we looked at each other and we we're like, we can either float here in the middle of the bay 
and wait for those guys with the little rubber dinghy to come and save us in front of our families, or we could hoist the sails and check what takes place, you know? I want to tell you, ladies, we hoisted the sails. And within a split second, we went from being idle in a storm nearly half over to being accelerated across this bay. We were locked in, literally locked in. I mean, I'd seen it in the movies. We lived it out in real life. We had our feet locked in. I had my hand on the water and it was, I was like, Woo! and I was just going and my hand was touching the water and the boat was lifted up like this and it was amazing and it was exhilarating and all it was was just shifting the sail just a little bit, just a little bit. And God told me when I came here today, He said, tell the ladies to adjust the sail just a little bit. And tell them to sit as they are on the boat. And tell them to expect all I am in the boat. But just let them know it's not going to happen with the sail down. I need you to shift your sail, girls. So come on, let's pray. Let's believe that God is going to do that in this moment.